I've had a wonderful time being with you here in the North Carolina Annual Conference, and I'll be indebted for a long time in the very best sense of the word for the generous and kind invitation of your bishop and uh, for all of you who along with her have showered me with love and hospitality, welcome and generosity. I know that uh, Bishop Hope and uh, Dr. Mike have had this experience as you've moved among the congregations of the North Carolina Annual Conference. You've probably driven away wondering if everybody received the welcome that we receive when we show up at a church, and with, with rare exceptions, of course. Um, no, you don't have any of those here in North Carolina. There. I just, Cynthia and I just sometimes feel so overwhelmed with the generosity of people when we visit the local congregations, uh, gifts of welcome, prayer shawls, you know, all of the expressions that are sometimes very contextually and locally nuanced. And I wonder if everybody who walks through the door had that experience, would we be having the same conversations about church membership and worship attendance. So what you have done for me, I'm sure for the other guests of the annual conference during these days, if those will be your practices in all the places where you live most of your life, in those congregations, faith communities, and communities at large, I'm absolutely confident that the membership decline of the United Methodist Church will start its turnaround right in the North Carolina Annual Conference. So there's no pressure here, but <laughs> you may want to give it a try, and please accept it as uh, my, um, my response of gratitude for all that you have shared with me uh, during this time of conferencing and reunion. I want to offer um, a few uh, verses of scripture, and uh, if you have your textbooks with you tonight, I'm in Luke chapter 24, beginning at the 28th verse. And someone asked me earlier in, um, in one of the passageways uh, where I was reading from, and I read last night and will again tonight be reading from the Common English Bible. And uh, I hope you have availed uh, yourself of this, uh, not because it's the only translation, but uh, it simply adds further illumination for those of us that speak American ease, American English. And it's quite well done. It's an ecumenical translation, but you should know that your church, through the United Methodist Publishing House, has indeed published the Common English Bible. So this is what it says. When they came to Emmaus, he acted as if he was going on ahead. But they urged him, saying, stay with us. It's nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So when he went in to stay with them, after he took his seat at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scriptures to us? This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Drop thy still dews of quietness till all our strivings cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress. And let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. Speak through me this night if you so choose, O oh God. Speak in spite of me tonight if you need to. Let the cross be lifted up, your son glorified, and your people edified. And grant that in all things the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts 
will find acceptance in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I brought with me an old friend tonight, and the friend is sitting on top of my copy of the New Testament. It's a book by Henry Nouwen entitled Life of the Beloved, Spiritual Living in a Secular World. And now 25 years since its printing almost, it is more relevant to me than ever. I'm on at least my second copy, probably because I lost my first copy. But my recollection of the first one is what I see in this second one, that it is well-worn and well-marked because of these timeless words, thoughts, and insights of the now deceased Henry Nouwen. The book is framed on this wise. It begins with a friendship. A young writer goes to visit Nouwen while he is working and teaching at Yale Divinity School. And he is to do a biopic piece, 750 words or less, to appear in the regional edition of the Sunday New York Times. They have their conversation and their interview and then seem like they are moving in different directions, but uh, what is turns out not to be a chance but a providential conversation moves across the years from one encounter into a deep friendship. The writer's name is Fred. He's doing these biopics, but the yearning of his heart is to really write great novels. And so now one begins to draw him out about why he's not doing what he really wants to do. And there's a lot of back and forth on that. And, and he challenges Nowen about the way in which he is living his life and practicing his ministry. Nowen, a Jesuit priest, obviously a Christian, and Fred, a not terribly observant secular Jew. And yet there is a chemistry there. And there is a deep longing that they learn from one another. And finally, Fred says to Henry Nouwen, you know, you have so much to say to people like me that are thoroughly secularized. For Nouwen had encouraged him to turn to the scriptures of his own tradition. We call it the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. And Fred said, hey, I'm not really into that. And Nouwen said to him, if you read nothing else, read Ecclesiastes. The next time they came together, Fred said, you know, there's something really there. I found something in the Bible, and I found myself there that there was a place for me, a confirmed cynic. And so their relationship matures, and Fred is concerned for Henry, and Henry is concerned for Fred, they are both concerned about the spiritual life, and while Nouwen has found it through the church and so-called organized religion and the practice of his ministry, Fred says to him, there are a gazillion of us out there who are secularized, but we are hungering for something that we do not have. And then he offers this challenge to Nouwen. He says, you and by implication, you and your ilk, as in church people, but I added that in. Keep talking to each other. But there are untold numbers of us that need what you have. Why don't you write something that speaks to us of the deepest things of life, things that are spiritual, things that will put us on the path to meaning, things that will help us to interpret the ambiguities and the contradictions of life. And so here, a not terribly observant Jew, by his own acknowledgement, thoroughly secularized, challenges a Roman Catholic Jesuit priest to unveil and to give, I would say, the gospel away. Right from your heart, he says, 
and say something to us that will speak to our hearts. We who are secularized, and I would add, we who are unchurched, and we who are de-churched, will you Christians stop only talking to yourselves and about yourselves and talk to the world. And so now and does. He's challenged, he's confronted, he's busted out. What starts as a friendship between two individuals becomes an attempt to share the good news about God and the ways of God and the things of God with people that may not understand themselves to be terribly godly. And so he says to Fred in this book, Life of the Beloved, which is kind of sent as a letter to Fred in several segments, he said, after lots of prayer and thought, I want to say two things to you. I want to give you one word to anchor everything, and then I want to give you four words to frame your life. And they are the words for us tonight. He says the first word is beloved. I want to remind you that no matter where you are, he says, on the journey with faith or without faith, secularized or spiritual, you are the beloved of God. May I say to you, even if you're churched up and churched out, you need and I need to be reminded that I am the beloved of God, not just fixtures in an institution, not mere bureaucrats and functionaries who are keeping the oil going on to the machinery of the church, but we are nothing less than the beloved children of God. Some who know me know that my favorite passage of Scripture, if I were forced to choose one, is in the first epistle of John, the third chapter. It says, See with what great love the Father hath loved us, that we should be called the children of God, and thus we are. And beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. It's already good enough news for me to know that I'm a beloved child of God. And then God puts a little something, something else on it and says it does not even yet appear what I'm going to be. And the writer goes on to say, but this we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. We're on a journey. We're headed somewhere. And at the end of the day, it is toward godliness. We are the beloved of God. And every other human being is a beloved child of God. I said to the saints gathered in Portland and to you by extension, we are the beloved children of God, period, hard stop, end of sentence. You are the beloved of God. And what we have to give to the world is a sign and to become an incarnate expression that everybody we meet is a beloved child of God. And if there are any exceptions, you and I better get out of line. Either God loves all of God's children without reserve, or everything we've said and everything we've done is a lie. Or we have, if not lying maliciously, we've simply misunderstood. We get it. You love us, but not without reserve. But that's not what I read in the book. And that's not what I've experienced in my life. 
even in the times and the seasons when I've tried to run in the other direction because sometimes I've not felt very lovable and sometimes, like all of you, I haven't felt like I wanted to be loved. I just wanted to be left alone to do my thing, to live without connectedness and community. But at the end of the day, that love kept wooing me, and I've seen it chiefly in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. What sacrifice. Did you hear the choir tonight? They went on about their business, didn't they? What, what self-giving <laughs> on the part of God that we should know such great love. I spent eight years in Iowa, and I learned a lot. Precious people, they are a part of the making of who I am as I've tried to grow in my faith, my discipleship, and my leadership. But one of the things about the joy of itinerating as a pastor is, is you get to hear different narratives, and there are some stories that are the same, they just show up in different people. And there are some that are so related to context that you can't really understand them unless you've been there. And so when I was in Iowa, one of the people that I began to learn more about hadn't heard about him much since I was a little kid. And my parents were trying to indoctrinate me that there were people that looked like me with my skin tone who had made significant contributions and here I come as a fully grown adult to hear what I'd only heard as a child from my parents who were trying to school me about George Washington Carver. I knew of his days at Tuskegee through books and through learning in school of all of the patents that he had for the peanut and the sweet potato and so much more, but I'd never heard his eye story. And I didn't know that the United Methodist Church or United Methodist Higher Education had anything to do with it. He came out of the hard scrabble racial environment of Missouri up through southern Iowa to central Iowa and landed on the steps and the doors of Simpson College named after Bishop Matthew Simpson. Now you gotta understand Iowa is pretty non-ebony, let me just put it that way. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it is. There's, there's no bad people, it's just, that's just the way it is. And here in those days when there likely might have been more of an African-American population in Iowa because of migration to work in the coal mines in southern Iowa, here comes this young man desirous of higher learning to the stores, to the, to the doors and the steps of Simpson College in Indianola, Iowa, just 12 to 15 miles south of the state capital, Des Moines. He was taken in by that school. That was when you could still show up at university with no resources, just a desire to learn. You try that in this day and age and let me know how that works out for you, but <laughs> he showed up there was embraced by that school community and by the larger community. I'm not at all suggesting that there were not incidents that may have happened, things that he heard. But in the main, he was embraced and given the opportunity to flourish and to learn and to grow. And the rest is history. But here's the history you need to, to hear about George Washington Carver. As you think about your belovedness and the belovedness of every child of God, George Washington Carver is reputed to have said that for the very first time when I got here to Indianola, Iowa, and to Simpson College, a United Methodist institution of higher education, for the very first time, I truly came to believe that I really was a human being. I got to thinking, what if everybody that got near a United Methodist, a United Methodist church, 
a United Methodist higher education institution, a United Methodist health and welfare institution, a United Methodist hospital. You don't hear me tonight. I wonder if anybody, somebody off the streets, somebody with a different gender identity, somebody from a different zip code, somebody with no education, they got around some United Methodist and they could say, for the very first time, I really came to believe that I was a human being. Now, I'm, I'm not going to mess with you long tonight, but I came a long way to say this. I've just been wondering, is that what people experience when they come to your church? I left, because they might not be able to say, I left with all of the doctrinal knowledge about the triune God that I could ever need. But people are able to articulate after one experience, I felt loved, I felt welcome, I felt hospitality, I felt embraced. You don't have to understand the doctrine of the Trinity to know if folks have room for you. You can express the fullness of God in a whole bunch of ways because people know what they experience and what they feel. That's what I call giving the gospel away. Reminding the world. Reminding every individual that they are beloved children of God. And there might be some details that need to be worked out. But the favorite church mission statement I ever heard, I also heard that in Iowa. I won't bust the church out. But their soundbite, they had a longer mission statement, but their soundbite was this. Watch this. Jesus is life. The rest is details. I mean, that works for me. I mean, if I can get that resolved... Jesus is the life that I've been looking for. I'm a beloved child of God. The rest is details to be worked out. But I'm going to keep living into those two promises and those two assurances. I am a child of the living God. And Jesus Christ is life and said of himself and life more abundant. That's all I need to know. So now and said to Fred, you can anchor everything on the assurance that you are a beloved child of God. And in order to help you live into your belovedness, he said, I want to give you four more words. They won't be hard to remember. If you're church folks, you've heard them over and over and over again. You've sometimes even grimaced saying, didn't we just have communion week before last? <laughs> uh, no, not here. You all are <laughs> Eucharistic people. <laughs> I could have gone to any of the four Gospels, to the feeding stories, to the road to Emmaus. I could have gone to 1 Corinthians 11. These words are a litany and they are a liturgy and they are complete in themselves. Now and said, the only thing you need to understand to live into your belovedness is that you have been taken, you are blessed, and you are broken in order to be given away. <laughs> what Jesus said over the bread over the fish and loaves that you heard about so brilliantly this morning? Taken, blessed, broken, and given. Every one of us has been taken up into the hands of the living God. Not for wrath, <laughs> but out of tenderness and chosenness. Every one of us knows knots of blessing and blessings in our lives. Knowing that we are blessed is not 
a rejoinder to say that everything is Pollyanna. In fact, the recognition of our blessings has to come in the midst sometimes of our struggles. You're not just blessed when everything is going well. It, it doesn't take much good religion to shout and praise the Lord, write hymns and sing psalms unto the Lord when everything is going well. You may not know how blessed you are sometimes until you're laying on your back. I mean, I marvel at people whose faith is like that, and I, I confess that there have been seasons in my adult life where I have measured my alignment with God by the blessings that I've received. Instead of embracing and affirming the fact that I can acknowledge anything is a blessing all by itself. God said to the Hebrew children, you, you know, if, if you will frame your life in a particular way, he says, you're going to be blessed going in and you'll be blessed coming out. He said, you're going to be blessed in the field and you're going to be blessed in the city. God is a God of blessing. And I used to tire of, the, of the, the informal litanies and liturgies of the churches of my childhood. Seems like they would repeat the same things over and over and over again, especially if you went to prayer meeting. Lord, I thank you that you woke me up this morning, clothed in my right mind, gave me a reasonable portion of health, blood running warm in my veins. Until one morning, Myself or somebody else I cared about couldn't move out of the bed. Or somebody that was walking around upright was no longer clothed in their right mind. I began to understand the power of that repetition. Lord, I thank you that you woke me up this morning. Blood still running warm in my veins gave me a reasonable portion of health and clothed me in my right mind. I could go on and on and on and on about blessing. We don't have enough time. And if you got to testifying about the blessing in your life, a multi-year revival would break out in the North Carolina Annual Conference. You've been chosen, you've been took into the very hands of God. The deacons worked that thing, didn't they? Had a, you, you, and just imagine God's, God's hands. I mean, we got to think anthropomorphically. <laughs> just imagine God's hands have taken up your little life. <laughs> I, 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 frankly, I don't know if that I should say this, but I'm going to say it because I, I used to not like when Mahalia would come on, he's got the whole world in his hand. But now that I'm on this side of whatever age, <laughs> I'm happy to know God's got me in God's hands. And not just me. I mean, do you, do, did you hear how she worked? You, you, he got you and me, sister, in God's hands. I mean, so, so this acknowledgement with a simple song. We're in the loving, tender hands of God who pours upon us blessing after blessing, even in the midst of our struggles. And we are those who experience and know brokenness in our lives. <laughs> and there's two ways to think about brokenness now and suggest it is the griefs and the sorrows and the pains and the disruptions and the alienation and the estrangement that comes our way. That's one way to think about our, 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 our brokenness. And he says, when you get to brokenness, what you got to do in order to make a life is to put the brokenness under the blessing. You don't hear me tonight. He said, but if you can get your brokenness under the blessing, you can pick your feet up and put one foot in front of the other. You can hold your head up even when you bow down with tears. Get your brokenness and your pain under the blessing. 
But he says the other way to think about our brokenness is that raw materials don't always serve us that well. They are not terribly utilitarian. You had a great meal tonight. Something got crushed, bruised, and broken to get the food on the table. When you cook at home, you, you slice, you dice, you crush, you bruise, you add heat, so that its form is changed. That's also brokenness. So brokenness sometimes is the process that we go through in order to make our stuff usable. Usable for us, for our neighbor, and for God. I know y'all are teetotalers, but there are probably a few wine experts in here you, you don't get any wine unless you pick the grapes off the vine and they got to eventually get in the wine press. They are broken, crushed, bruised. The bread doesn't get to the Lord's table unless the grain is gathered from the field. And the wheat and the chaff have got to get separated. And the wheat ground into a form that makes it usable. All brokenness is not bad stuff. It's just stuff to get it from here to here. And the reason why stuff gets broken sometimes is in order that it might be given away because it's more useful in that form than in another form. So now one says, if you can remember these simple things, let them be a, a lens, a, a filter through which you manage the experiences of your days. Understanding that at the end of the day, there was always a vision on the part of the living God that we be poured out into the world. You know, we spend a lot of time trying to save the church. I think it's well-meaning. Don't get me wrong. I'm not sure it's our agenda. Our agenda is to be the church and let everything else fall where it may. We're running around chasing our ecclesiastical tail. trying to save what only God can save. Martin Luther said only the word of God is going to save the church. Our responsibility is to get in the word and the word gets in us until we become the living word and be the church. Stop trying to save the church. I heard the master say, if you seek to save your life, you're going to lose it sure enough. Sure enough, take up your cross, he says. He says, run in the direction of self-giving. Institutional behavior runs in the opposite direction. How can we preserve it? Now, we need institutions because they create capacity and they give us leverage but when our mission becomes the saving of an institution for the institution's sake, we may be done 
I, I didn't come. I'm not coming to frighten anybody. I'm not coming to stir up any controversy. That's already been done <laughs> by people more expert at controversy than me. But I'm just musing. Are we spending our time on the right thing? I mean, I mean, Bishop Hope and I know, and every district superintendent, everybody's been a district superintendent, knows how many conversations we've had with local churches. Well, you must be here to close our church. <laughs> the reality is, it's already out of business in some cases from really being a church. I'm not mad at it. I mean, it's okay. I got it. You want Aunt Sally Sue to get buried there and Aunt Sally Sue's great-grandchildren to come back and be baptized and married there, but, but it's, it's lost its usefulness to be an incarnate sign of the kingdom of God. in the world. I mean, we, we, we keep churches open in some cases. That this is, must be all up my way, uh, just so folks can have funerals. And, but why, watch this. I mean, this is how wicky-wacky this is. We, we, we're following a cat. We're following a dude that said, let the dead bury the dead. I mean, you know, I, I know, I know you don't, you don't want to become fundamentalists, but, <laughs> you, 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 but you just can't not take that seriously. I mean, apparently it wasn't all that important to Jesus. I mean, when he went around death, he either raised folks or got raised. Hmm? He broke up funeral processions and professional mourning parties, and we're keeping local congregations open to have five funerals between now and 2020. Come on, people. Now, the master also said, I know y'all be glad when I'm going, when the master also said, <laughs> except a grain of wheat fall to the ground and die. Hmm. It's just a grain of wheat. It's got to go down in the ground. It's got to die. But in that death, there's resurrection. In the bulb, there is a flower. And in the seed, an apple tree. Everything we need to know about the gospel economy is all we already know. So how long are we going to keep engaging in the patterns that lead to our death anyway instead of running toward life? Which is always to be found in following, serving, and emulating Jesus Christ our Lord. So I got a big give and a big ask. They're really one in the same. I'm going to quit. I'm tired. I got more to say, but you can't bear it all. <laughs> I, I got a whole conference I got to go back and preach to. I mean, here's the, here's the, big, the big question. If, if we're taken, blessed, broken, only to be given away, huh, why are we clutching so tight? The early Christians, it is said, had upon their lips and their hearts in pursuing the question of the mind of Christ that though he was in the form of God, thought not his equality with God a thing to be grasped or clutched or clung to too tightly. But he, I'm talking about Jesus now, emptied himself and became obedient unto death. And then the editors say, even death on a cross. So I just wonder, 
if the big give is that we just give the church away. Hmm. I mean, just give the gospel away. Give incarnate, beloved community away. And we give it away by embracing more and more people into the circle of this unfathomable love. We've tried it every other way. History is filled with the wreckage and the ruins. And when we were at our best, we were giving the gospel away, preaching in our churches, starting institutions of health care, caring for the orphans and the widows. When we were giving it away, United Methodist higher education institutions never started out to be elite institutions. They started out to make education accessible to everybody. Why don't we just give it away? Give it away! Give it away! Just try God and see if we give it away. If God won't give us more church, more gospel, and more love, then we know what to do with. We have absolutely nothing as United Methodists to lose. After all, what do you have? that you haven't received. And if it wasn't yours in the first place, why don't you give it away? In the name of God who creates, redeems, and is making all things holy, let the church say, Amen.